Welcome to this talk on a Christian response to the climate and ecological crisis. My name is Melanie and I'm part of a movement called Christian Climate Action. I now live in London, but my family is originally from India and I myself was born in Kenya. And then I spent the majority of my childhood growing up on an island in the Pacific. Climate change is very real in all those places. So this topic that I'm going to talk to you about this today is something that's very close to my heart. But it's really my faith that drives my response to this crisis. And so, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. And then I'm going to explore some of what is happening to the world. And finally, I'll be looking at how we can respond to this. Now, I'm going to be presenting with slides for those who like a visual prompt. Uh, for those who don't, I hope you don't find it too distracting. So a good place to start thinking about a Christian response to the climate crisis is to ask why God's creation matters to us. Of course, this amazing planet is our life support system. Everything we need, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, and the ground upon which we build our homes is a gift given to us by God. But it seems to me that there's more to it than that. And the Bible has lots to say that should guide our relationship with Earth and how we should live on it. And there are two things that are particularly important to me. The Earth and everything on it belongs to God. And God considers the earth and everything on it to be very good. It's loved by God. And if it's loved by God, should it not be loved by me? The other fundamental commandment for me is the commandment to love my neighbor as myself. And so I think about who is my neighbor and whether I'm acting in a way that values and safeguards that neighbor's well being as much as my own. I'm probably not giving away anything if I say that what I'm going to speak about next suggests that we, and that we is actually the systems and the structures that human beings have put in place to manage our relationships with each other, to govern how we use the earth. Well, we aren't doing, in my view, too well with those commands. Let's explore very briefly what's happening to this gift from God, this holy creation, and to our neighbors on our watch. Heat waves, droughts, storms, rising sea levels, flooding, wildfires. These are all the consequences of the extra energy that's being pushed into the system by man-made global heating. And this climate crisis is not something in the future. It's already happening. We are at around 1.2 average temperature increase on pre-industrial levels already. And that means that around a third of the global population are already experiencing warming of more than 1.5 degrees centigrade. And that is already bringing untold suffering. And on top of that, we're also destroying the environment through things like deforestation and extraction and pollution. According to studies, we're producing waste and using the Earth's resources far more quickly 
then they can be absorbed or replenished. Effectively, we're using up our annual ecological budget by about August each year. We just don't respect the earth and we don't live within its natural limits. And as a result, the ecological crisis that humans have created is yet another crisis of epic proportions. Now we're in an ecological crisis. It's caused by the way we use land, which is directly connected to overconsumption by the relatively rich nations. And we're in a climate crisis that's caused by the burning of fossil fuels, which produces carbon dioxide. This chart shows how global average temperatures have been rising in tandem with atmospheric carbon dioxide. Increased CO2 causes an, an accompanying temperature rise. And I've already said that we've reached about 1.2 degrees centigrade of warming above pre-industrial levels. But you can see that we're currently heading for around three degrees by the end of the century. And that to halt this global heating, we have to stop putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now the science on this has been clear for decades. And as I've said, the impacts are already desperately obvious all over the world. And yet since the formation of the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC in 1988, we've actually emitted more CO2 knowing the consequences than all of our emissions previously. We've had warm words from politicians, expensive talking shops, thousands of legal cases, 50 years of environmental campaigning, and none of it has worked in reducing or even leveling off the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Governments had a chance to take meaningful action at COP26 in Glasgow in November 2021, and again at COP27 in Egypt in November 2022, but they've failed to do so and they continue to fail to take meaningful action. The average estimate of temperature increases that the pledges that we currently have would bring us to, we think, around 2.4 degrees centigrade. And that's scary enough, but what is even more frightening is the gulf between the promises and the actual policies to implement these promises. It's terrifying because it looks like current policies take us to a central estimate of around three degrees centigrade warming with a worst case scenario of about four degrees. And it's really important, just moving slides, there we go. It's really important that we acknowledge that there are also tipping points for the climate. What we're talking about are, well, it's a point of no return when we might actually lose control of the system. And there's a significant risk that we're going to do this if we don't make rapid changes. An example of a tipping point is the forest in the southeast of the Amazon which looks as if it's beginning to release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere instead of being a carbon sink. And another is the sea ice melt that's changing ocean currents. And this is scary stuff. If the world warms much beyond two degrees, then there's a good chance that it will reach a point at which it will be impossible to avoid runaway global heating. just want to show you what that might look at like. So this map shows the likely events of a four degree rise in average temperature across the globe on where in fact people will be able to live. And it doesn't really bear thinking about, I, I can't, 
I almost can't wrap my mind around this. But in a way, I don't need to, because the human impacts of the climate and ecological emergency are already apparent in human suffering from the extreme weather events, from climate migration and refugees and the accelerating erosion of non-human life on Earth. And at, even at two degrees, let alone at four degrees, that suffering reaches almost the limits of my imagination. So let's look at some of the statistics and you can use your imagination to try to think what this might in fact be like. One of the statistics that really gets me is that up to 5 billion people, particularly in Africa and South Asia, are likely to face not only food shortages, but clean water shortages. Because you might think that glaciers are nice to have, uh, sad to lose, but life will go on. Well, hundreds of millions of people rely on Himalayan glacial melt on an annual basis for their drinking water. And if the glaciers melt completely, there will be massive water shortages. But at the same time, 340 million or more people living in coastal areas, including in the major cities like Dhaka and Tokyo, uh, New York, Miami and Amsterdam, they'll be flooded out, disaster movie style. And there'll be mass displacement of up to a billion people, most likely the worst affected being the poorest. In fact, almost certainly the worst affected will be the poorest. There'll be conflict over resources, war, civil war, riots. And that's not all. We critically depend on the Earth's natural systems, and yet biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate and the pressures driving this decline are intensifying. This is the number of species, the percentage of each species that's under threat, or should I say each group. But what we know is a million species are at risk of extinction. And crucially, 41% of insects are threatened with extinction and they're vital for pollination. And it's not just how many species we're losing, it's how fast we're losing them. Species are being destroyed at around a thousand times more than the background extinction rate typical of the Earth's past. So these are some of the things you may be feeling in response to what I've been saying. Maybe you've heard it before and you just feel a sense of relief that you can talk to someone about it, acknowledge it. Or maybe you haven't heard the real deep truth of this and you're in shock or denial. All of these reactions are absolutely appropriate and to be expected. And I think maybe we just need to take a few moments to acknowledge them. Yes, I find it really, really hard to face up to the reality of this situation. It, it feels really grim and I kind of want to turn off, but my faith doesn't let me do that. I know that there's hope. And by hope, I don't mean optimism. I think hope means that you need to roll up your sleeves and do something. And here's the good news. 
it's actually not too late. We have a small window of time to bring about real action before it's too late. And every bit of warming that we can avoid helps. I love this mural. It's by Jane Mutiny. And if you're in London, uh, you can uh, find it in Islington. So we know that change needs to happen now. But we also know that politicians can't bring themselves to make difficult decisions. It's partly the way in which the system works. Politicians always promise things will get better under their leadership. And when they are elected, they then look for short term solutions to justify their sunny promises and difficult decisions get pushed to the next electoral cycle. So the time of making hard choices is always postponed. It's kicked into the long grass. And we can't keep doing that. It's not working. It's obvious that an endless growth on a finite planet will lead to collapse. We can't have a constant demand for economic growth that assumes that the environment is an endless source of raw materials, clean water and air and fertile soil, and an endless sink to dispose of waste and pollution and assumes that all these resources are free forever, that waste has no consequences forever. Because we're now using about one and three quarter planets and we only have one. It's a recipe for disaster. And big oil and big money, big corporate interests and press billionaires, they're actively lobbying against meaningful change making it all so much more difficult to do something about this crisis. And if we do nothing else, we need to stop fossil fuels from being extracted and used. We need to do this rapidly and entirely and forever, because if we don't do that, then we will fail. It's that simple. And yes, personal action and lifestyle changes are really, really important. We need to look to ourselves. But it's also really, really important to know that those changes on their own are simply not enough. Most CO2 is emitted on our behalf and it's entirely out of our control. It's from sources like electricity generation for industry. It's in airports and shipping and agriculture and heavy industry. It's like deforestation, things like exploitative fishing and peat bog and mangrove destruction. And even the vast deserts of monoculture farming, they're all likewise outside our control. And so it's critical that we make governments and international organizations and corporations change. We're reminded in the book of Micah that the Lord requires of us that we act justly. And in tackling this crisis, it gives us the chance to redress some of the great injustices that we've created, some of the societal injustices that are in the structures of our society. The climate crisis has highlighted these injustices and it amplifies them. In so many ways, the roots of the climate crisis are the very same roots of all these injustices. One of the reasons that I came to be someone that cared so deeply about tackling this crisis is I realized that all the other things that I had been concerned about in my whole life were amplified by this climate crisis. If I give money 
to alleviate a drought in the Horn of Africa, if I work to stop human trafficking and know that all that will be undone by the coming crisis, then it seems to me that it becomes fundamental that I work to tackle this climate and ecological emergency. And I know it isn't going to be easy. That great champion of justice, Martin Luther King, reminds us why it isn't going to be easy. Human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle. The tireless exertions and the passionate concerns of dedicated individuals. But Jesus never said the way he calls us to would be easy. So the question is, what are we called to do? What would Jesus do? Well, the synoptic gospels tell us that Jesus radically empowered the poor and disenfranchised in Galilee. And he then set his face to the central authorities in Jerusalem. And he started a walking campaign of nonviolent civil resistance against the injustice. And he walked that right into the temple where he disrupted business as usual in protest at the injustice and the exploitation. What would Jesus want us to do today in the face of a crisis that unleashes vast suffering on the poor and vulnerable, that's destroying the future of his children? I think that Jesus calls us to go to our own Jerusalems, to turn over the tables of injustice and to speak out for justice and peace. He would not expect us to be people of contemplative prayer. He would insist that we should also be people of action and effort in our resistance to injustice and our seeking of a world where all can flourish. And this is what we do. Christian Climate Action is a community of Christians supporting each other to take meaningful action in the face of imminent and catastrophic anthropogenic climate breakdown. That just means human caused global heating. And so we follow the example of Jesus and we're also inspired by social justice movements of the past, like uh, the US civil rights movement. And we use those methods to urge those in powers to, to make the changes that are needed. And that doesn't mean we all take part in civil disobedience, but we acknowledge that others in the movement will be doing this as a powerful and important tool. And it does mean that we do more than write letters and sign petitions. In fact, since November 2018, Christian Climate Action has worked closely with Extinction Rebellion, and we've kind of become known as the XR Christian Community Group. But we do have strong and independent roots that have grown over the last decade. For some of us, this means doing things that will lead to arrest. But for many more of us, and I'm one of them, we don't put ourselves in that position. Sometimes that's because we feel we shouldn't. And sometimes that's because our life circumstances mean that we're not in a position to put ourselves in the way of arrest. But there are lots of things for everyone to do. In this fight, we need everyone and everything. And on the slide, we've got some of the things that we do, ranging from prayer protests to 
admin and outreach. We look at theology, we look at local issues. We do talks and trainings, and we support and encourage people to develop their ideas and their creativity. And in fact, really just showing up is such a valuable contribution. There are so many good and nourishing things about being part of the Christian Climate Action Community. I've personally experienced all those things on this slide. And key to what we do is praying together. We have online morning prayer every day and on a number of evenings each week for those who want to come. You don't really even have to be part of our movement. You can just join us in prayer. Uh, on Saturday mornings, we have an hour long session of talks and reflections and learning, both spiritual and practical. We pray before and during taking actions. Some of our actions are prayer, just prayer in public. We want to open our hearts and to be guided by the Holy Spirit in all that we do. Because we know that we don't always get it right. We won't, that is the nature of being human. But we do know that we cannot be bystanders. So this is an invitation. You don't have to join our movement, although we would love for you to do so. But stand with us on the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th of April. Refuse to be a bystander. There's lots of information about that on our website. And I'll be sharing the uh, email address as well as the website address in a moment. So you can just make a note of that when we come to it. And if you do want to get to know us a bit more before then, you can join the new to CCA Zoom meetings. We have them regularly the next date is on the website you can sign up through the website to be uh, a recipient of our monthly email newsletter i promise you it's not very long it's got lots of click through links but you can just read the bits that you're interested in uh, and maybe you want to join together with other people in your area and form uh, a local CCA group. We've got quite a lot of them already, and we're all, always looking for people to start new local groups. So here you are, our um, website address. If you visit that website, you can you can just Google it, christianclimateaction.org. If you visit that website, uh, you'll find all the details of everything I've talked about today, some of the actions that we do. You'll be able to see more about us and you'll find our email address. So the words on the screen are not ours. They're the words from the United Nations. What we do is to help prod that push for concerted global action. We move it forward. And we'd like you to do the same. So thank you 
for bearing with me, for listening to this. I hope you will feel moved to some action with us or with another environmental group. Most of all, I hope I'll see you in April. Until then, goodbye.